OK. Uh, bonjour et merci de vous être joint à nous aujourd'hui. I know that this is a special time of year for many Canadians with Easter, Easter Passover and Vaisakhi coming soon. We must all stay strong and continue to practice physical distancing. Please stay at home unless you are doing essential work like stocking grocery shelves or working on the front lines of our healthcare system. This year's celebrations will feel very different as all of us find ways to meet with our families and friends virtually rather than in person. But it is absolutely crucial that we continue to follow these rules to protect our families, our friends, our neighbors, and our country. Je sais qu'il s'agit d'un moment spécial de l'année pour plusieurs Canadiens et Canadiennes, avec Pâques, Pesach et Vaisakhi qui approchent à grands pas. Nous, les Canadiens et Canadiennes, doivent continuer à pratiquer la distanciation physique. Restez forts et restez à la maison, à moins que vous fassiez un travail essentiel comme remplir les tablettes à l'épicerie ou fournir des soins de santé. Cette année, les célébrations sembleront très différentes, mais c'est essentiel que nous continuons de suivre ces règles afin de protéger nos familles et nos voisins. Today, we are going to hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, our Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Anita Anand, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines, et le Président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. And with us is our Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, also available to answer questions. Dr. Tam, please. Hello, everyone. Um, bonjour à toutes et à tous. As usual, I'll start with an update on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 17,063 cases, including 345 deaths. On the lab front, we have now completed testing for over 346,000 people in Canada. Of these, 5% are confirmed as positive. So we are able to track where the spread is occurring. Our greatest worry continues to be the numerous outbreaks in high-risk settings where there is rapid spread of COVID-19, as well as severe outcomes in vulnerable people. These settings include long-term care, hospital and correctional facilities, but also an increasing number of First Nations and at least one Inuit community. A single case in any First Nations, Inuit or Métis communities is high cause for concern. These communities are among the most vulnerable to COVID-19 due to distances, access to necessary resources and underlying health conditions. In response to the heightened risk, I'm heartened to hear of the additional steps that leaders of these communities are taking to protect their populations. And we need to all do everything we can to slow the spread of this epidemic and protect all vulnerable Canadians. We've talked a lot about masks over the last few days, and I want to just make a few very important points regarding ma mask use. D'entrée de jeu, je répète que les masques médicaux se sont rares partout dans le monde et qu'ils doivent être réservés à l'usage des travailleurs de la santé et autres personnes donnant des soins directs à un patient atteint de la COVID-19. Porter un masque non médical ou un couvre-visage peut représenter une couche supplémentaire pour protéger et de ne pas infecter les autres, même si vous ne présentez pas actuellement de symptômes. Cette pratique peut aider à réduire la transmission par des gouttelettes de salive projetées par la tous lorsqu'il est impossible de garder une distance physique de 2 mètres notamment dans les transports en commun ou à l'épicerie. Par contre, le port d'un couvre-visage ne doit pas remplacer un lavage fréquent des mains et l'éloignement physique. Sans cela, vous ne pouvez pas vous considérer comme étant protégé contre la COVID-19. First, I'm reiterating that medical masks are in short supply worldwide and they must be conserved for healthcare workers and others providing direct care, 
to a COVID-19 patient. Wearing a non-medical mask or facial covering can be an additional layer to protect and not infect others, even if you're not currently symptomatic. This can help reduce spread of respiratory droplets to others when you can't maintain a two-meter physical distance, such as while you're on public transit or getting groceries. However, wearing a face covering does not preclude the need for frequent hand hygiene and physical distancing. Without these, you cannot consider yourself protected against COVID-19. But face coverings are not appropriate for everyone or for all ages. In particular, face coverings could present a suffocation risk to babies and children under the age of two, anyone who has difficulties breathing, and others who are unable to remove the mask by themselves. So thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, the that's okay. Please. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. Bonjour. To first, let me say that our hearts are with the families of those who have lost their lives to COVID-19. I want to thank the companies that are working so hard to retool, repurpose, and innovate to fight this disease together. And this is what it means to be a Canadian, coming together to keep our community safe and strong, to help protect our frontline healthcare workers, and to save the lives of Canadians who become severely ill with COVID-19. And I also want to emphasize, as many others have said here today, that we all have a very important role to play to defeat this virus. As it gets warmer outside and with religious celebrations like Easter and Passover, Vasaki and Ramadan coming, it's important to keep avoid gathering with others. This means that we're going to have to postpone our barbecues and our family dinners for now. So stay at home. Don't invite others to your house, even if they are members of your own family. Limit your comings and goings, and if you absolutely must leave your house, keep a two-meter distance from everyone. That's a hockey stink length. And keep using the Canada COVID-19 app to learn how to protect yourself and others. All Canadians have a very important role in getting through this difficult time together. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And we will now hear from the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Anita Anand. Anita. Bonjour tout le monde. I'd like to reiterate that my thoughts are with those who are suffering and those who have lost loved ones. Alors que nous continuons à travailler dans cette situation vraiment extraordinaire, je tiens à remercier les équipes qui travaillent jour et nuit pour assurer que les Canadiens auront l'équipement dont ils ont besoin. Votre travail est essentiel aux efforts contre le COVID-19 et nous vous en sommes extrêmement reconnaissants. Public Services and Procurement Canada is aggressively and proactively buying in bulk from all available suppliers and distributors here at home and around the world. I'll take a moment here to highlight some of the steps that we are taking in this regard both domestically and internationally. Comme le Premier ministre l'a mentionné, une livraison est arrivée de la Chine hier. Nous avons reçu environ 8 millions de masques chirurgicaux et de commandes faites directement par la Nouvelle-Écosse et par le Québec étaient aussi à bord. Nous attendons plus de livraisons dans les jours et semaines à venir. As the Prime Minister mentioned, there was a delivery from China yesterday. We received roughly 8 million surgical masks and orders made directly by Nova Scotia and Quebec were also on board. We are expecting more deliveries from China in the days to come, as I will describe. The reality is that we are operating in a highly competitive global environment and international logistics are challenging. We are working closely with our partners around the world, including embassies as well as with on the ground logistics and coordination firms to ensure that supplies can move from source to where they are needed in Canada right here right now. 
with hundreds of millions of pieces of equipment ordered, this is a complex undertaking, even as those supplies arrive in Canada. As the Prime Minister announced late last week, we have entered into an agreement with Amazon Canada, which will use its Canadian distribution network, including key partners, Canada Post and Purolator, to manage the distribution of personal protective equipment and supplies purchased by the government. As part of our efforts to ensure that these supplies are deli delivered absolutely as fast as possible when they are ready to ship, Amazon is providing these services to Canadians at cost, without profit. En ce qui concerne la collaboration entre les administrations, je peux confirmer que vendredi passé, j'ai tenu mon premier appel de la table ministérielle avec les provinces et les territoires sur l'approvisionnement pour lutter contre la COVID-19. There is strong support for our Team Canada approach to buying in bulk, which we and the provinces and territories consider essential to securing as many supplies as possible in highly competitive markets. We are working collaboratively together, and it is truly heartening to see. Je tiens également à souligner que nous travaillons en étroite collaboration avec les provinces et les territoires pour offrir de l'espace sur nos vols nolisés afin de les aider à ramener leur envoi au Canada. Les commandes de, nou de la Nouvelle-Écosse et du Québec d'hier sont des exemples de cette approche collaborative en matière de transport. As an update, on equipment ordered, including this order delivered yesterday, we have sourced more than 230 million surgical masks to support the response. Over 16 million have been delivered to date. We have also roughly 75 million N95 masks on order. We expect to have roughly 2.3 million masks in Canada's possession by the end of the week. Amongst other supplies, we have also ordered over 113,000 litres of hand sanitizer, most of which is expected to be delivered this month. We have received 20,000 litres in the past 24 hours and are expecting another roughly 10,000 litres this week alone. On ventilators, as the Prime Minister mentioned, we have relationships with CAE, Ventilators for Canadians, and Starfish Medical for thousands more of these life-saving machines. There is no question that a lot of work is going into sourcing all of these health supplies and many more supplies in Canada and around the world. But I know that the work does not end there. We will not rest until these supplies are in Canada in our hands and ultimately in the hands of the many healthcare workers on the front lines of this crisis. Notre objectif est d'assurer que la, les Canadiens ont l'équipement dont ils ont besoin pour combattre le COVID-19. Canadians can be assured that we are doing absolutely everything we can day and night in a challenging international context. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. And now we will hear from the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdi Baines. Nav, please. Uh, merci, Christia. Uh, depuis deux semaines, le gouvernement mobilise le secteur canadien de la fabrication industrielle dans la lutte contre la COVID-19. We've seen and continue to see Canadian companies across the country making tremendous contributions to our healthcare system. Pour faire face à la crise, plusieurs se regroupent et adoptent de nouveaux outils et de nouveaux objectifs pour innover comme jamais. Les Canadiens peuvent être très fiers. To date, 
nearly 5,000 Canadian companies have contact, contacted us to offer their expertise since our call to action. Nous avons agi rapidement pour lancer un appel à l'action analyser les lettres d'intention et passer les bons de commande. And I'm very proud to see that in a very short period of time, we've helped create new partnerships to secure a supply of Made in Canada ventilators from Thornhill Medical, CAE, Ventilators for Canadians, and a group led by Starfish Medical. This will allow us to acquire 30,000 ventilators. These companies and partnerships are Made in Canada solutions leveraging mostly Canadian intellectual property and manufacturing expertise. In creating these ventilator partnerships, we assembled an evaluation panel to run an accelerated due diligence process to expedite the production of Made in Canada ventilators. And this panel is comprised of health specialists, medical practitioners who have treated COVID-19 patients, engineers, manufacturing specialists, and government officials. We're also working with one of Canada's Nobel Prize winning researchers. Dr. Art McDonald, who is leading a team of scientists to develop an easy-to-produce ventilator using off-the-shelf accessible parts. And the goal is to develop a ventilator model fit for current needs that can be constructed quickly and reliably in Canada. As we've mentioned before, we're also supporting Medicom to boost its domestic production capacity of medical masks, and the goal is to help the company scale up to make tens of millions of masks per year right here in Canada. These steps will reduce Canada's reliance on international suppliers for masks and ventilators, and this is critically important right now. Here's another great example. We heard that our medical workers were concerned about not having enough medical gowns to keep them safe in the front line. The material for gowns has traditionally not been produced domestically, so we needed to find a made-in-Canada solution to secure our domestic production capacity and keep our frontline care workers safe. By engaging with industry and thinking outside the box, we were able to come up with some innovative solutions. And it turns out some materials used for construction, house wrap, and car airbags can be repurposed for medical grade gowns. To leverage this Canadian innovation, we're linking up with producers of these materials with apparel manufacturers like Stanfields and Canada Goose, among others, to produce millions of gowns made with newly sourced Made in Canada fabrics. What I want Canada's healthcare professionals to hear today is that we as a government are doing everything we possibly can to secure the equipment they need to keep them safe in the fight against COVID-19. This is about helping those real-life heroes save Canadian lives. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you very much, Nav. Et je donne maintenant la parole au président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Jean-Yves, s'il vous plaît. Euh, merci, Christia, et j'aimerais procéder rapidement à une mise à jour de l'état de la situation sur les demandes de la prestation canadienne d'urgence. Hier, nous avons reçu un total de plus de 966 000 demandes de prestation canadienne d'urgence. C'est en une journée l'équivalent de ce que le gouvernement canadien reçoit normalement en six mois de demandes de prestations d'assurance emploi. Depuis le 15 mars, plus de 3,6 millions de demandes de prestations d'aide ont été formulées et de ce nombre, 3 millions ont déjà été traités. Évidemment, nous sommes très reconnaissants aux agents et aux fonctionnaires de l'Agence de revenus du Canada et de Service Canada en particulier pour leur détermination, leur engagement et leur travail acharné pour à la fois recevoir et traiter ces demandes. Nous sommes aussi reconnaissants aux Canadiens qui ont fait preuve de discipline hier et nous informons et nous rappelons à tous les Canadiens que ceux qui sont nés en avril, en mai et en juin peuvent aujourd'hui déposer leurs demandes de prestations canadiennes d'urgence. So I would like to quickly update Canadians on the state of applications for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Today we have, yesterday we received over 966 
applications for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. This is in one day the equivalent of what we typically receive over six months in terms of employment insurance benefit applications. Since March 15th, we have received over 3.6 million applications for emergency benefits. Uh, over 3 million of these applications have already been processed. And of course, we are very grateful for the hard work of Service Canada and Canada Revenue Agency workers who have worked very hard, not only to receive, but also to process these applications. We're also very grateful for the, for Can to Canadians for their discipline yesterday, and we remind everyone born in April, May and June that today they can also submit their applications for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Okay, merci Jean-Yves. Nous sommes prêts à répondre à vos questions. Okay, everybody knows the drill. We'll start with three questions on the phone before turning to the room. Operator. Thank you, merci. Please press star one at this time. If you have a question, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur l'étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. La première question est de Michel Lamarche, TVA Nouvelle. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. C'est une question pour le ministre Baines. Je vais la poser en français, Monsieur le ministre. Vous pouvez répondre en anglais euh, si le cœur vous en dit. Je veux simplement savoir, pour les fameux respirateurs, ces 30 000 respirateurs qui seront fabriqués ici au Canada, est-ce que vous êtes en mesure de nous dire dans combien de temps à peu près, on les aura. Est-ce qu'on parle de semaines dans ce cas-là ou on parle plutôt de mois? Pouvez-vous être plus précis? Oui, euh, merci pour votre question. Euh, la réponse est très simple. Euh, je pense euh, avec le, le système maintenant, nous pouvons euh, acheter euh, l'équipement essentiel dans les semaines. Uh, in a matter of weeks, uh, not months, uh, we can see the production of these ventilators for Canadian use and for frontline healthcare workers. Merci. Une sous-question pour Madame Freeland. On sent que euh, c'est réglé, oui, pour la question des masques de la compagnie 3M avec les États-Unis, mais le premier ministre a quand même laissé entendre qu'il pourrait y avoir dans les prochaines semaines et peut-être prochains mois d'autres problèmes avec d'autres types d'équipements médicaux. Est-ce qu'il y a euh, de la négociation qui s'est faite, Madame Freeland? On sait que les États-Unis, dans certains endroits, ont besoin de ces respirateurs. Est-ce qu'il y a du donnant-donnant? Est-ce que vous avez négocié? Est-ce qu'on est prêt à leur envoyer quelque chose pour nous, en retour, obtenir ce dont on a besoin pour notre personnel médical? Merci pour la question. Uh, et on a vraiment eu une bonne résolution avec les masques du 3M. Et je veux remercier surtout 3M et nos partenaires et voisins américains et toute l'équipe Canada qui a travaillé sur ça. Uh, concernant l'avenir, avec nos partenaires américains, on a fait l'argument que nous avons une relation réciproque est très balancé concernant les soins médicaux et les services médicaux. Nous avons une interdépendance et le meilleur résultat pour le Canada, mais aussi pour les États-Unis, c'est de continuer de travailler ensemble. Uh, nos partenaires étaient d'accord uh, et on voit ça avec le résultat qu'on a eu hier. Et on va continuer de travailler avec nos partenaires utilisant cet argument. Et évidemment, pas seulement utiliser l'argument, mais aussi vraiment travailler ensemble. Uh, we did uh, have a good outcome yesterday with the 3M masks. It was a real Team Canada effort. A lot of people were involved. And I would like to thank uh, the leaders of 3M who have been acting in a really responsible way. Uh, and also, of course, our American partners. We achieved that result by making the case to our American friends and neighbors that when it comes to medical equipment and medical services, the relationship between Canada and the United States is one of interdependence. It is a reciprocal and balanced relationship, and both companies, both countries do best 
when we work together. And that's why we were able to achieve a win-win outcome. That will be the argument that we continue to make and advance in our relationship with the United States in these truly difficult and complicated times. I think it's good news for Canadians and for Americans that that argument resonated with our partners. And we're just going to keep going in that vein. Merci, Madame la, première, la Vice Première Ministre. Prochaine question. Merci, thank you. The next question is from Theresa Wright, the, from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I'm not sure if this is best uh, uh, answered by Dr. Tam or, or Minister Haidu, but I'm looking to find out how many ventilators uh, that we have in Canada right now and how many you believe that we will need. So the um, actual ventilator capacity are within the um, responsibility of the provinces, of course, because every day some gets used and some uh, are then um, have, you know, they, they've cancelled elective surgeries, etc., to make sure that there's capacity in the ICUs. Um, from our perspective, we have uh, provided, um, based on request, ventilators to uh, a whole number of provinces and territories, and we are acquiring more, as you um, have uh, heard. And so we, before any requests were made by provinces and territories, we sort of preemptively already um, purchased another 600, close to 600. And then, of course, all the innovation and other um, channels of acquisition uh, also came into play as well. But I think it is uh, an area that you have to monitor in a very dynamic way, because every day there will be people admitted to ICUs and um, the availability of ICU beds will be very much based on local uh, epidemiology and uh, how many people are sick in that area. So it's not an even distribution in terms of uh, capacity uh, at, uh, on any given day. Um, okay. And um, also, Dr. Tam, I'm wondering uh, if you can talk about um, the science for the, or the data that you've looked at uh, in terms of the demographics of the people who are being most impacted by this illness. You know, I'm talking about, you know, gender, race, socioeconomic uh, status. Um, do, are you collecting this data and what is it telling you? Yes, we are collecting this, in, this information and, and the detailed information is actually available on our website. Uh, we do know that um, certain groups are um, really quite um, a lot of impacts in terms of severity and deaths, and those are people who are in the older age groups. And so um, both in, in terms of deaths, a large number, uh, the vast majority, um, and uh, over um, like 92 percent of deaths among those aged 60 or over and 62 percent are 80 years of older. And I think that reflects some of the epidemiology we're seeing uh, in long term care facilities, for example, where the average age of the residents are quite high. And that's why we're seeing that impact right now. Uh, and in terms of hospitalizations, um, again, um, skewed towards the older age groups. And um, we know that uh, it has been approximately 60% of hospitalizations are over the age of 60. But we have seen younger age groups being impacted for sure. And with uh, even young people, 20s and their 30s, um, sev several um, of those very tragic reports on people in those age groups um, also um, ha having fa fatalities. And um, we, you know, another way is to track um, ICU emissions. So we have about, um, of the case reports that we received, about 5% have been admitted to ICU. I would say overall, uh, the gender distribution or the sex, male to female, is approximately equal. Um, another phenomenon to remember is that, um, in fact, is adults, uh, particularly the working age group, kind of adults who have the most illnesses reported, but the, the, the severity of illness is skewed towards the older age groups. Thank you. Next question. 
Thank you, merci. La question suivante est de Micheline Laflamme, Radio-Canada. La parole est à vous. Micheline Laflamme, Radio-Canada, la parole est à vous. Je, je m'excuse, je croyais avoir euh, enlevé mon, avoir touché mon bouton, ça n'a pas fonctionné. Euh, alors, euh, merci beaucoup pour, pour euh, cette occasion de, de vous poser une question. Donc, le premier ministre a annoncé ce matin la production canadienne de respirateurs et d'autres équipements. Alors, moi, je me demandais dans combien de temps espérez-vous que le pays va pouvoir compter sur son marché interne pour ses besoins euh, en, en équipements divers, là, non seulement les respirateurs, ou allons-nous devoir toujours compter sur le marché international et ça, dans, dans quelle proportion? Um, merci pour votre question. Et notre stratégie est claire, euh, acheter, acheter, acheter et bâtir, bâtir, bâtir. C'est une stratégie très claire et c'est pourquoi nous avons à présenter un plan pour bâtir les respirateurs et les autres équipements essentiels ici au Canada. Quel pourcentage est difficile de déterminer maintenant, mais nous allons continuer à travailler pour chaque jour de, 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 de déterminer les, les capacités ici au Canada, mais la stratégie aussi pour à accumuler l'équipement nécessaire parce que ce n'est pas seulement nécessaire pour les Canadiens, pour les autres pays aussi. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Michel, en suivi. Euh, oui, d'accord. Merci. Et est-ce que le Canada doit se préparer à vivre des vagues successives de confinement euh, pour les 12 ou 24 prochains mois, un peu comme euh, l'Ontario le, le suggérait la semaine dernière? Merci pour la question, c'est Dr. New. Uh, c'est difficile à prévoir qu ce qui va se passer à, à l'avenir. Uh, on a des experts, on fait la modélisation, mais je pense que chose importante, c'est viser vraiment qu ce qui va se passer dans les, les semaines prochaines. Uh, c'est sûr qu'on uh, attend des bons résultats si tout le monde au Canada continue à pratiquer l'éloignement physique et, et uh, avec... Uh, euh, la, comme dit, la, la, la motivation de toute la population, on est toujours dans le même bateau. Euh, C'est important et, et on va voir qu ce qui va se passer au, au futur. Thank you, Doctor. We'll now turn to the room, starting with Molly from CTV. News. Uh, Minister Anand, you talked about the sourcing of PPE here, those huge numbers, 230 million sourced versus 16 million delivered. Does sourcing mean a guarantee that those are going to come into this country? And then also, can you help me understand a rough timeline when we're looking at, you know, 230 million uh, surgical masks, 75 million and 95 masks? When are they actually going to be here? Because we're sitting in a province where the premier has said we're running out of supplies by next week. Uh, thank you so much for that question. I want to begin by saying that we are operating in a very fluid and evolving market for PPE. Every single day, we are aggressively ordering in this marketplace, but we must recognize that there are risks posed by fragile supply chains. And there is a fluidity of this current situation that must be understood in this period of exceptionally high demand. In terms of your question relating to supplies and timelines, uh, ordering, of course, does not guarantee a delivery. Ordering means that we have placed an order and contract for products that we need to make sure find their way back to Canada. And in order to make sure that goods find their way back to Canada, we are taking very serious steps on the ground in particular com countries to make sure that the product meets the requirements that countries have before they leave the jurisdiction. For example, in China, we have engaged our embassy on the ground in efforts to ensure that our orders are delivered on schedule. And those uh, parties are also identifying new opportunities for us. We are also engaging directly with manufacturers on the ground in China. We are also engaged with 
private firms who are assisting us with quality assurance opportunities, in-country logistics, arranging transportation, and, for example, assisting us in leasing a warehouse in Shanghai that can store goods once they are sourced and brought out ready to export. Finally, we are arranging our own transportation from Canada. You've been told that two planes have already left China and landed here successfully, and we have another one coming this week. And so you can see that these supply chains are complex, but we are taking every effort to make sure that we get those goods back to Canada and in the hands of frontline healthcare workers difficult to give a timeline. That it is difficult, but I will say that we are working on short-term and long-term timelines. And in terms of the short term, we've got 2.3 uh, million N95 masks arriving in Canada by the end of this week. So we are seeing progress on that front. My second question um, has to do about EI. I mean, what happens if a person runs out of EI in the coming weeks? Maybe, maybe this is Minister Duclos. Um, these people right now can't qualify for that emergency benefit, but we know that the Prime Minister has signaled that that might be brought in the emergency benefit. Could people that don't have any more EI in the coming weeks be a part of that? Very good question. And uh, as you know, there are two different things happening. The first one is the implementation at a very rapid pace of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which initially had the objective of being emergency, not only in name, but also in action. So we knew that, was, that what the most important thing to do was to secure the ability of people to make ends meet for those that had no income whatsoever. Now, we are moving into a, a second stage, and the Prime Minister made it clear yesterday that we are also considering other actions to help other people that may not have lost all of their income, that in fact may have uh, may be working in conditions where they don't have the income that the $2,000 uh, Canada Emergency Response Benefit would otherwise provide. So there are a number of other situations which we are also considering. Thank you, Julia Van Dusen, CBC. For Dr. Tam or perhaps Patty Haidu, considering this is a global um, pandemic, when will we know it's over? Uh, for example, if we get rid of it here, but it's rampant in some other countries, what would that mean for us? Uh, thanks, Julie. That's an excellent question, and it ties into what I've been saying all along, which is that we cannot fight this alone as one country that, in fact, it has to be a global solution and why it's so important that we work with partners all across the country. And you heard Minister Baines reference that if we don't need all the ventilators, they would go to another country. These are the kinds of actions that I think countries are going to have to take together. If there is one case of COVID-19, uh, then we are all at risk because, of course, um, we, you know, even if you think about uh, previous pandemics, you know, hundreds of years ago, they were global pandemics, despite the fact that there was less global travel. Uh, viruses and bugs have a way of making their way around human population. And so the work that we do with the World Health Organization in order to partner with other countries to understand the science together, to accelerate the science and research as a partner country in that organization is extremely important. And I think your question is very is a very wise one, because, in fact, um, what we see in countries that have crested their first wave is that uh, they have to keep a very close eye on new cases. And uh, until we all have a global solution, um, this virus will be with us and we'll all have to work together to prevent uh, its reemergence in any of our countries. Thank you. Did you want to take a jab at that, Dr. Tim? Considering it's still just one question, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's precisely the case. So. Uh, Canada will try extremely hard, as we have been doing, um, to um, reduce this first wave. But the global population uh, is not Im started off being completely not immune to this virus, completely new. So uh, until the global population attains a certain level of immunity, uh, we will continue to see uh, this virus uh, having the ability uh, to hit any country. So um, th this is a really important point in terms of international collaboration. Finding those solutions like treatments and vaccines, of course, will be really, really key uh, in the coming months. And any time that we can buy uh, for, for that to actually occur uh, is, is absolutely crucial because, um, you know, if uh, global um, solutions are not found, 
this virus could potentially continue to circulate uh, for, for some time. We actually don't know, as Dr. New said, that we actually don't know what will happen um, you know, after the first wave and uh, in the months to come, because um, there's different possibilities as to whether this virus then becomes uh, more entrenched in the human population, uh, like influenza, whether it would undergo mutations. So all of these things are unknown at this time, but uh, every country in the world is affected now, and none of us will uh, be able to manage this without um, coordination. Um, uh, so, considering all this talk about masks, and I'm talking about cloth masks, uh, do you, Dr. Tam or Patty Haidu, plan to wear one when you grocery shop, when you can't do physical distancing, considering that so many of us could be positive and not know it? Yes, yeah, so I think um, if I'm going out and I can't maintain physical distancing, um, absolutely, that's one option, because I want to protect others. Uh, recognizing that actually the evidence is, is not, you know, quite there, but it is an added layer of prevention and protecting uh, uh, um, the spread to others. Um, and um, again, um, it's not necessarily there to protect myself. I think I have to have that reality check uh, and the fact that I have to still do the hand washing and uh, still do the physical distancing uh, as much as possible. I think that is, um, you know, reasonable uh, and feasible advice. Thank you, Dr. Mike. No question. No, absolutely. If there was not a way for me to uh, practice social distancing, I wouldn't hesitate to wear that. And with the direction of Dr. Tam in terms of how to do it properly, um, and being very aware that uh, it would be a new experience for me, I haven't worn one yet, and so I would probably feel like I would want to fiddle with that mask given uh, given the newness. And I think that's one of the risks about wearing a mask is to wear it properly and to understand that uh, it is, a, for many people who haven't worn one before, an uncomfortable experience and that there'll have to be some self-awareness around the tendency to want to adjust it. Um, at this point, I haven't had uh, had to, the, to wear a mask. I, uh, I have been able to practice social distancing without one. Thank you, Minister Operator. Over to you. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Maura Forrest, Political. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is probably either for Deputy Prime Minister Freeland or Minister Anand. I just wanted to get um, some real clarity around this uh, question of masks coming in from 3M. So we understood from the Prime Minister that there are 500,000 masks um, from 3M coming in tomorrow. But I just want to be very clear, that's not to say that we have a full exemption from the White House at this point. Um, and I guess further to that, are there other shipments coming in um, of N95 masks from the U.S. this week? Uh, so just to be clear, and uh, the statement that 3M put out yesterday was very clear, uh, 3M has received clear assurances from the government of the United States that shipments to Canada will continue unimpeded. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, we are expecting a shipment very soon of 500,000 masks, and we have more shipments directly from 3M to come. Now, we do have uh, other pending shipments from other sources in the United States. And we are working collaboratively with our American partners to be sure that those shipments also can make it to Canada, just as our American partners are working collaboratively with Canada to ensure that the medical supplies and services that the United States depends on from Canada can continue to flow to the United States. I don't know, Anita, if you want to add anything. I would just like to add that it's a full court press on procurement right now. So when a situation crops up with regards to supplies coming into Canada, whether it be from the United States or any other country, we work diplomatically and we work collaboratively, but we are aggressive in terms of ensuring that the supplies make their way back into Canada. And that's why I described that situation with China and uh, 
Christia has done a wonderful job talking about the United States, but it really applies to every country that we are determined to make sure that supplies get back to Canada once they are ordered and procured. And that is our main task, and we won't stop until we get it done. See, Nav wants to add something. Go for it now. Thank you. I'll be fairly brief because I think it's, an, it's important to note, as we recognize, as, as uh, Anita has said and Christia have uh, highlighted, that, of course, there's strain and stress on our global supply chains. But that's why we're also looking at meeting Canada solutions that look at domestic sourcing as well. So the key thing to highlight for the ventilators that are built in Canada or the gowns that are made in Canada, for instance, that were announced today, those source materials, those raw materials are also part of the local supply chain as well. So this further insulates us for any potential challenges that we may see in the near uh, future. So I think that's an important aspect of when we talk about made in Canada. It's not only the final product, but also the raw materials that go into building that final product. Thank you. Minister Mora, follow-up? Yes, thank you. And uh, Minister Anand, you mentioned 2.3 million N95 masks coming in this week. Um, can you say where those are coming from? Um, and also, you said you'd ordered 75 million masks. I think that works out to about 3% that are supposed to come in this week. That seems very low. Do you, do you realistically think that we're going to be able to fill that full order of 75 million masks? Thanks for the question. Let me start off by saying that talking about the supply chain and the stresses on the supply chain at the current time requires us to be sanguine about the numbers, but also realistic. I can assure you that now that the 3M shipment is coming across the border and will arrive tomorrow, I can also assure you that we have a plane that is going to leave China this week with another shipment of N95 masks on it. Apart from that, I won't be able to, and I'm sure people here will, dis will agree with me that we are in an era of volatility in global markets. And so every step of the way, we are making sure that the supply chain can function as it should and where we see shortfall, we will be definitely relying on domestic supply chains to be ramped up and providing equipment to Canadians so that we have complementary supply chains operating at the same time, both domestic and international. Thank you, Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. La question suivante est de Hélène Buzetti. Le devoir, la parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. J'aimerais revenir à cette question des masques, Madame Freeland. Vous nous aviez dit plus tôt la semaine dernière, je crois, que 3M était un fournisseur très important pour le Canada. Mais j'aimerais savoir, existe-t-il d'autres entreprises américaines qui nous fournissent de l'équipement médical de manière significative? Et pour ces autres entreprises, ont-elles obtenu euh, la même exemption de 3M qui leur permettra de continuer à nous approvisionner? Euh, merci pour la question. Oui, bien sûr qu'il y a des autres entreprises américaines euh, qui sont des fournisseurs importants pour le Canada. Euh, et on continue, cas par, cas par cas, de travailler avec ces fournisseurs et avec, euh, évidemment, le gouvernement américain. En suivi. OK. Donc, j'en comprends qu'on n'a pas nécessairement obtenu la même exemption. Euh, Monsieur Duclos, je voulais juste revenir à une question pré posée précédemment par une collègue sur la question de l'assurance-emploi. Euh, C'est une question à laquelle je cherche une réponse depuis longtemps. Donc, quelqu'un qui est déjà sur l'assurance-emploi et dont les prestations viennent à échéance maintenant ou d'ici quelques jours, ces personnes-là ne trouveront probablement pas de travail dans un cours à venir, malheureusement, euh, peuvent-elles, ces personnes, appliquer à la prestation d'urgence? Mais comme je l'ai dit en anglais tout à l'heure, puis je suis heureux de le répéter en, en français, euh, Madame Buzetti, il y a deux objectifs absolument importants qu'on a suivis dès le début. Le premier, c'est de mettre en place la prestation canadienne d'urgence pour répondre aux besoins d'urgence de centaines de milliers. Et maintenant, on sait que ce sont des millions de Canadiens qui n'auraient pas eu autrement aucun argent 
pour joindre les deux bouts. Alors, c'est ce qu'on a fait rapidement. Et la deuxième chose que M. Trudeau a annoncé hier, c'est que là, on est dans une étape d'aller plus loin parce qu'on reconnaît que ce gigantesque filet de sécurité sociale laisse passer malheureusement quelques personnes à travers certaines de ces mailles. Et M. Trudeau a déjà annoncé hier qu'on travaille activement sur beaucoup des cas euh, que les gens ont en tête, dont celui des cas là, de gens qui auraient... Euh, qui, qui seraient en voie de perdre leurs prestations d'assurance-emploi. Merci, M. le ministre opérateur. Prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Oui, merci. La question suivante est de François Carabin, du journal Métro. La parole est à vous. Bonjour. Euh, ma question s'adressait particulièrement à, à Madame euh, la ministre Annan. Euh, donc, euh, en fait, je me demandais, là, bon, on parle beaucoup de la, de, des, des, euh, des demandes d'approvisionnement de, en, euh, euh, en équipement qu'on a fait euh, depuis la semaine dernière, entre autres, à l'extérieur. Vous aviez mentionné... Euh, Bon, je pense que ça fait exactement une semaine, en fait, le mardi dernier, euh, qu'il y avait des commandes, je pense, de 60 millions de masques qui avaient été faites à l'intérieur du Canada. Je me demandais, pour la province du Québec, êtes-vous capable de dire combien de masques sont arrivés euh, en date d'aujourd'hui ou en date d'hier? Merci beaucoup. Ça Merci beaucoup. Ça, ce n'est pas seulement une question pour moi, mais aussi pour peut-être euh, ministre Haidu ou Dr. Tam, mais euh, je, je voudrais dire que euh, quand nous avons commandé des masques, c'est aussi nécessaire de, de montrer le, les fournisseurs et les investissements médicaux essentiels euh, pour assurer que les biens vont arriver en Canada. Pour le Québec, je voudrais demander à, à Dr. Tam si elle a quelque chose d'ajouter. Nous, nous avons une entente avec euh, toutes les provinces et les territoires et l'entente le, 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 a spécifié à le, le, à le quantité quantité de, de, de le, le médico uh, supply, supplies. Oui, ce que je veux ajouter, c'est Dr. Nu, que la situation est toujours fluide. Hein. On ne peut pas vous donner des chiffres exacts parce que au fur et à mesure, on reçoit toujours des livraisons euh, d'un de, de, jour à l'autre. Et euh, comme Dr. Uh, comme un ministre a aussi uh, constaté, on a déjà, comme on dit, une entente, une, une même un cadre d'allocation euh, entre le gouvernement fédéral avec toutes les provinces et territoires pour assurer qu'il y a une, 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 une mécanisme pour euh, euh, donner les, les équipements essentiels au fur et à mesure, comme c'est nécessaire de dépendance s'il y a un foyer ou une région plus touchée euh, d'une euh, une partie de, du pays que, que l'autre, on est toujours prêt comme, comme un pays. M. Carabin, on suit. Oui, donc j'en comprends que, bon, évidemment, la, la demande peut changer de jour en jour. Mais jusqu'à maintenant, de, depuis, disons, la semaine dernière, là, au moment où vous avez fait des, des commandes importantes, avez-vous un, un chiffre, nombre de, que ce soit des masques, que ce soit des respirateurs, d'équipements qui est arrivé euh, dans chaque province? J'aimerais justement une précision sur le nombre au Québec. Est-ce que vous en avez un? Moi, personnellement, non. Je pense que peut-être c'est plus une question pour les autorités au Québec parce que c'est eux qui euh, reçoivent l'équipement les, 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 essentiel et euh, peut-être ils, euh, ils ont des, des chiffres plus à date que nous autres. Mais euh, moi, personnellement, on sait on continue à travailler euh, étroitement avec nos homologues de toutes les provinces et territoires, incluant le Québec. Et euh, c'est quelque chose, c'est une bonne collaboration. On est continue avec euh, le travail ensemble. Merci, Dr. Nous, ceci met fin à la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui. That's it for today, folks. Thank you. Je pense que Anita veut ajouter quelque chose sur ce point-là. Un, un, un petit, un petit, Mathia. Uh, J'ai mis en place uh, un engagement régulier avec mes homologues partout au pays afin de m'assurer que toutes les régions, le Québec inclus, ont ce dont elles ont besoin, y compris les fournitures et l'équipement médical. Donc, c'est important que Québec est à la table avec tous les autres et nous discutons régulièrement ces choses. 
So I just want to... Um, Tam wants just to add something to Yeah, you. I just want to remind everyone this is World Health Day. This is La Journée Mondiale de la Santé. And today we are recognizing the incredible work of nurses and midwives. Donc, merci à toutes les infirmières, les sages-femmes. Merci.